What's up, guys? Have you ever tried touching a certain thing and then you think, ooh, that, that, that feels nice. What, what sort of material is this? What is it made of? So, you know, touching like your shirt and you're like, ooh, that's soft. Or, you know, like the speaker, you can see some texture there. You feel it, ooh, that's a nice, interesting feeling. So sometimes you ask, what is it made of? And then the best way to see what it's made of is to actually look at it very, very closely. In this speaker, you can see that it's made up of a sort of a thread-like substance. But then what if the details are too small to see, right? Like in this water bottle, it's metal. No matter how closely you look, it's a smooth surface. It's not really not easy to tell about the details of what it's made of specifically. It's just one flat thing. So when the details are too small, for you to be able to see with your naked eye, you need something to help you understand or see the tiny, tiny details. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the tools that we use in order to see the tiny details, as well as what exactly living things are made of. My name is Saramon, and this is Science with Saramon. Let's get right into it. So, what are you made of? Are you made of courage, valor, kindness? These are virtues and they are abstract values that we can't really observe so it's not really part of the realm of science let's leave it to values and philosophy teachers okay so for us let's keep it concrete you are an organism you're a living thing and living things are organized in a sort of hierarchy of levels so organisms are living things they're made up of organ systems organ systems are of course made up of organs so your organs here and organs are made up of tissues which in turn are made up of you should be able to answer this by now they're made up of cells so cells are the building blocks of life but how big are cells they're very very tiny so in order to figure out uh, stuff about the cells we need to investigate all these different objectives as well as uh, the tools needed to be able to see them again cells they're quite tiny. If you look at the cells of your hand, if you try to look using your naked eye, you won't be able to see them. So in order to see things as tiny as cells, we need microscopes. Because it's the little things that matter. You need to be able to see the little things. So who invented the microscope? Who actually made it? Honestly, no one actually knows for sure because in history, it gets kind of complicated. So supposedly it was made during the, around the 16th century. And there is one person that's credited for it. He's, he's the uh, inventor of the microscope. His name is Zacharias Janssen. He's Dutch. He's a spectacle maker for glasses. And supposedly he made the microscope in 1590. Now the reason why it's sketchy is because his birth records say he was born in 1585. And if the microscope was invented in 1590, well, that makes him how many years old, right? So sketchy. Another thing that makes him sketchy is that he also was caught for counterfeiting and then went on the run and then went bankrupt so you know if you can actually make microscopes why would you go bankrupt right if you're skilled enough to make a new thing anyway who made microscopy a big deal like why is it so important why did it not just become a novelty thing so the one who made little things matter is the scholar known as Robert Hooke so Robert Hooke is a renowned scholar and past curator of the Royal Society. The Royal Society is one of the oldest academic institutions on earth. And if you can see here on the left, we have a question mark for a portrait. So no, he's not the riddle. It's just that there's no portraits of him. Why? There's uh, this guy that he had fights with, lots of scientists, scientific disputes with. His name is Isaac Newton. You may have heard of him. So Newton eventually became the president of the Royal Society and since he didn't get along with Robert Hooke, supposedly people say that he let Robert Hooke get uh, obscured out of history. So he let Hooke's legacy be buried in the sands of time without actually uh, giving him a fair chance. Uh, others say that he actually ordered that portraits and uh, in, uh, discoveries of Robert Hooke be burned or uh, put into waste or locked away, stuff like that. But despite that, Robert Hooke is someone that we are studying now. So, you know, he kind of failed in that regard. So Hooke coined the term cells and he called them cells because it, rem it reminded him of the rooms of monks in monasteries. The, the, these are like uh, little cell rooms. All right. So this is actually a picture of oak, uh, oak cork, the cork part of oak. So that's the exact same specimen that Robert Hooke observed in order to coin the term cells. Now, Robert Hooke made microscopy cool through his book, 
micrographia. Literally, he drew uh, microscopic, uh, he looked at microscopic images and then drew what he saw. So he put it into focus. So this is actually a flea that Robert Hooke drew, digitized into an image and part of this slide. So it's actually very, very detailed. He's quite an artist. Okay? So arts and sciences go together. But Robert Hooke was not the eventual father of microbiology. He's not the one who was credited with microscopic organisms. The flea, while small, is not microscopic. You can still see an actual flea with your naked eye. So things that actually can't be seen without a microscope that are living were discovered by a draper. A draper is someone who is in the textile business. He sells curtains, blankets, carpets, anything that's made of cloth. So what is he doing here? This guy, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, so he's a cloth seller turned into a self-taught scientist and eventually became a fellow of the Royal Society. Big name in uh, this uh, set of slides. So he was really, really into making quality cloth. Now, in order to get quality cloth, you need quality fibers. So he wanted to see high quality fibers in his cloth. But the problem was that at the time, lenses were really crap. So even the best of lenses couldn't let him see the fibers of his cloth. So what he did is he made his own lenses. Perhaps inspired by the fibers of his own cloth, he made a unique way of making lenses. So he um, heated silicates, the stuff that you make uh, glass with. So once it, once it was red hot, he pulled them into very thin strips, very thin strings, and then rolled those strings into lenses. And because they were made up of fibers of glass, those lenses become, became extremely uh, high quality. So his lenses didn't just let him see threads, they were so good that they actually let him see things that couldn't be seen at all, not even a clue with a naked eye. They were better than the lenses made by actual professional lens makers. So he was the first to observe what he called animalcules. In the modern era, we call these protozoans. They are microscopic animals. So the animalcules, as he called them, were something that weren't believed in by the Royal Society. They're like, no, that, that can't be real. That can't be true. There can't be complex animals that are too small for the naked eye to see. But once he showed them his work, again, he's not a full scientist. He doesn't know how to publish a paper. He just showed them his drawings. Like, huh, look what I made. And they're like, wow, you can't be making this stuff up. And he also gave them copies of his uh, microscopes, his self-made microscopes. And they're like, huh, okay, and now I see it. So again, irrefutable, they made him a fellow of the Royal Society and he became the father of microbiology. Again, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, the father of microbiology. So how can we tell when a microscope is actually good? There are certain parameters of microscopy that we check if a microscope is good. There are three. So the first is a measure of how many times bigger the image is compared to the object. It's actually magnification. So magnification is formally the ratio of the image size to the object's real size. So generally something that's magnified looks bigger than the object itself. And if we turn that definition into a mathematical statement, we get magnification is equal to image size divided by the object size. Excuse me. Take note that magnification is always denoted with a capital X, like uh, 10 times, as you can see here. Excuse me. Wow, I'm hiccuping. So again, uh, for magnification, in order to have the ratio between image and object size, the sizes have to be in the same units. You cannot divide the image size by the object size. If they're different units, you'll get the wrong answer. So be very careful. Make sure you have the same units. Bye. So let's try this 10 centimeters and 5 times, okay? If your image is 10 centimeters and your magnification is 5 times, if you input that into the actual mathematical statement, we get M, which is 5 times, is equal to the image size. Again, the image size is 10 centimeters. 5 is equal to 10 divided by what we're looking for, or the object length. So the object size or object length, let's replace that with... Uh, a variable, let's say a. So 5 is equal to 10 divided by a. If you isolate a, you should be able to get the answer a is equal to 2 centimeters because 10 divided by 2 is equal to 5 times. All right? Simple, quick algebra. Next, 
What's a measure of the difference between the dark and the bright areas of an image? This is called contrast. So contrast is uh, the differences in either color or brightness that makes an object distinguishable from its surroundings. So example of that is this x-ray diagram. When there's extremely high contrast, you can no longer see the faint ribs, individual ribs of the rib cage. In low contrast, you also can't see them because it's too bright. Everything looks gray and white. So the optimum contrast is, is somewhere in the middle where you can see the fine details and it's not too hard to distinguish things that are of relatively similar color. And it doesn't just apply to x-rays, it also applies to microscopes. So how do we increase contrast in microscopes? We can't really just run image editing on them. So what we do are things like staining techniques. So we can apply stains using chemical dyes. These dyes can stick to certain types of cells or certain parts of cells, depending on the type of chemical dye. So it becomes easier to distinguish things or parts of cells, but they tend to kill the cells because the dyes get embedded in all the important structures. One important uh, type of staining is gram staining. As outlined here on the right side, gram staining has two stains that allow us to make high contrast images. So we have the primary stain, crystal violet, called crystal violet because it's a crystal and it's violet. So it can stain most things. So it'll stain this one and this other type of cell, a gram negative cell. More on that later. Next, after a primary stain, we apply what's called a mordant. So remember this term, a mordant. So a mordant actually embeds the stain into the uh, parts in which the stain gets uh, stuck in. So in this case, for gram-positive cells, the mordant makes it get stuck in almost every part of the cell membrane or the skin of the cell. In gram-negative cells, the mordant actually doesn't embed the primary stain because it doesn't have certain types of uh, molecules in its cell membrane or cell wall. So next after the mordant is the decolorizer. So anything that didn't react with the mordant and primary stain will be uh, will have the dye loose on the uh, specimen. So the decolorizer will remove the dye if it didn't get stuck due to the mordant. So for gram-positive specimens, the decolorizer will just remove the excess violet. While for gram-negative, all of the violet didn't stick, so the decolorizer will remove everything. So what's next is what we call a counter stain, in this case safranin, which is a pink dye. So safranin will stain anything that was colorless but is not part of the background. So what happens is that your gram-positive parts of the cell become violet, dark violet. Your gram-negative cells or parts of the cells become pink and your background becomes white, increasing the contrast for many types of parts and types of cells. Right? So again, that is gram-staining. Another way to increase contrast is phase contrast microscopy. That sounds really complicated because uh, it deals with light and the properties of light. So light gets scattered when it passes through different media, like how light gets refracted by water. It's the same for cells. When different densities of uh, cell structures are hit by light, light gets scattered into different angles. In phase contrast microscopy, the angle of scattering of light is uh, manipulated so that when the light reaches your eyes, the specimen is usually brighter and the background gets dimmer or the other way around. This is one example. A bright field image just uh, is the standard light microscope image. It's just light everywhere. So it's kind of fuzzy because the light just uh, overwhelms everything. In phase contrast microscopy, the light that goes through the background is uh, eliminated as much of it as possible without making everything black so it becomes dimmer and the light that is scattered by the actual parts of the cell are redirected so that it becomes darker for certain structures. What happens is that we have high contrast. We have the structures looking like they are embossed against a uh, flat background. So it's like you have, you have an imprint of your specimen. So that's phase contrast microscopy. So next, what's the measure of the amount of detail in an image? This is the third parameter. This is actually resolution. So you should be familiar with this if you watch YouTube videos, stuff like that. So resolution is the amount of Im uh, image detail. 
In microscopy, it's also formally defined as the shortest distance that two points can still be distinguished from each other. What does that mean? In this case, on the left, uh, the lower resolution image on the top left, if you zoom in on that square, if you look at the image, you can't distinguish between the points. The same image with higher resolution, if you zoom in, you can see individual points. There's yellow and there's black and so on. So again, there is a shorter distance where points can still be distinguished from each other. So again, the paradox here is that higher resolution means that the distance should be shorter. So shorter distance, better resolution because you can see more detail. So you have the basic microscope. So that microscope is actually called the compound, compound light microscope. It's called compound because it has two lenses for higher magnification. So this is what it looks like. And those are the parts on the left. If you did the activity, the warm-up activity, you should already be familiar with these parts, but we'll go through them really quick. So it's called a compound lens microscope because of these two lenses, the eyepiece lens and the objective lens. So those two have a multiplicative uh, effect on magnification. So if you have a five times eyepiece and a 10 times objective, five times 10 means 50 times magnification. So it becomes very, very powerful. The objective lenses are uh, mounted on a revolving nose piece. So it's actually a rotating nose piece. So it rotates so that you can select an objective lens. So there's different magnifications for different objectives. The special type of objective is called, one of the special types is a oil, an oil immersion objective. It's extremely high magnification of 100 times. So it needs a special oil to be put on the lens so that it minimizes the refraction of light. Next, you have the stage where you put your specimen. You can clip it on using stage clips. Now your stage has an aperture, which is just the hole through which light can pass through. Oh, Lord. So again, light can pass through the aperture. And the light comes from a light source, sometimes called an illuminator. The light goes through an iris diaphragm. So you can see here a small lever or lever. So you can move that lever so that you can close or open the iris diaphragm, much like closing and opening your eyes so that you can control the amount of light. The condenser above an iris diaphragm just focuses the light onto the aperture. And finally, some of the most important parts, the focus knobs. We have the coarse and the fine focus knobs. The coarse knob, the bigger knob, allows you to move the focus in a much greater scale so that you can find uh, the uh, better part of the focus of the specimen, while the fine focus knob just moves it ever so slightly so that you can fine tune the focus on the specimen. All right. So see, these are some additional properties that are in compound light microscopes. For magnification, again, it's compounded, meaning you have to multiply the objective magnification with the eyepiece magnification to get the total magnification. Another concept is the field of view. When you look through the eyepiece, what you see, the image area that you see, usually it's a circle, is called the field of view. So you have a limited field of view in your light microscope. And the higher the magnification, the smaller your actual field of view is because you're looking at a more, uh, more closely at your specimen. All right? Your depth of field, finally, is a layer of depth that is in focus. When you move the focus knobs, you're not only focusing the light into the eyepiece, you're also moving the depth of field, meaning how deeply uh, the light is focused on. So you can make it so that you can focus on the surface of a specimen or focus on just beneath the surface, for example. So what happens exactly to images in the compound light microscope? Is it just magnified? Does it just get bigger? Or is it in a way transformed? So the answer is that yes, it's transformed. It's actually inverted. Like in your specimen of E in your light microscope, the E is inverted to something that looks like a Roman A. Hey, or uh, Times New Roman A. So the reason for that is because of the compound lens system, it flips images. And it, since it flips images, what you see is flipped. The movement is flipped as well. When you move your slide to the left, even if in real life you move it to the left, in your uh, vision, it will move to the right. So again, even movement is inverted. So light has its limits. Your compound light microscope can only do so much. The max resolution of light is around 200 nanometers due to the wavelength 
and frequencies of light as a wave. Again, the properties of light limit its resolution. So in order to break that barrier of resolution, you need something that is smaller than the wavelength of light itself. And what else can be small other than electrons? Electrons are the one of the smallest elementary subatomic particles. So since they're extremely small, they can be used for extremely high resolution images. So you, bomb you bombard your specimen with electrons and have a detector of those electrons in order to see uh, what your specimen is like. So you have two types depending on how the electrons are used. The scanning electron microscope scans the surface of the specimens. Again, only the surface. So this is an SEM image on your right. So you can see it's very cool, it's very 3D, but you can't see under the surface of the specimen because they are actually treated by coating them with a heavy metal such as gold. So an extremely thin layer, like one or two atoms thick layer of heavy metals is put onto your specimen and then electrons are bounced off of that heavy metal. And the way they bounce allows us to form images that are 3D and very high resolution. The other type of electron microscope is the transmission electron microscope. Your electrons are transmitted through the specimen. It's not bouncing off of it. It goes through and gets scattered by the different densities, much like the concept in phase contrast microscopy. But in this case, they need to be stained with heavy metals as well. So the heavy metal stain allows for different densities in different types of uh, materials within your cell or within your specimen. And then it is encased in resin so that your specimen is protected and the resin coating also allows it to be sliced very, very, very thinly. So we use a special tool. Take note of this. The special tool is called a microtome. Again, a microtome allows you to slice things into just a few molecules thick. And that allows your electrons to be transmitted through your specimen. This image on the left is actually the endoplasmic reticulum of a cell. So this is just a summary table of the differences between the different types of microscopes. We have the SEM, the TEM, and the CLM. So your electron microscopes and your compound light microscope. For visualization, you can see your specimen based on electrons for the electron microscopes and light for a light microscope. Duh! Your sample preparation, your electron microscopes will kill your sample if it is a living thing because of the metal used to stain or coat it. For compound light microscopes, it's possible for your specimens to be alive if you don't use staining procedures. Again, if you can just look at them without staining them, then they can be alive just like that video that we saw before. The image produced by your microscopes can be 2D or 3D. Only the SEM can produce 3D images. The others make 2D images. And for magnification, we have, of course, 1 million times maximum magnification for your electron microscopes, while for your compound light microscopes, only the very best ones can go up to 1,000 times magnification. Any more than that, and you can't actually see anything because of the resolution barrier of 200 nanometers. So you deserve a break because we've been looking at the details of the microscope's history and the different types of microscopes in modern time. So we'll continue the next meeting with the cell theory, the cell size, and the cell shape. So I hope you guys understood this and I'll see you guys in the next video.